and we'll start the meditation. So noticing when you come into your body any residual feelings that may be there from the excitement of joining the online session. Sometimes computer technology takes you quite a ways out of the body into a little bit of a spin or a flurry. So just recognizing that now you have your eyes closed. You can still sense that there are people here together but also that you're in your own space, your own inner world, which no one else can enter. It's personal to you. This is a place where you don't have to perform. You don't have to be anyone or anything. There's nothing to get right. Not even any feeling that's good, worse or better. So just taking this opportunity to meet yourself exactly where you are. Some of you have been busy all day, probably taking care of others. Maybe reading. But now you only have one concern and that is to come in contact with your body and mind and meet yourself with some kindness and care. So just noticing how your body is positioned. Gently scanning through every limb. And listening to the feedback that your body gives to you. Respecting if the body wants to be adjusted a little bit. Making sure the heels, the ankles are not pressing into the leg or into the ground. The weight is distributed fairly evenly between the thighs and the buttocks. So that there's a sense of feeling grounded. As though the earth were holding your weight, allowing all the tensions to drain down. The muscles in the legs, the buttocks can relax. Give themselves to the earth, to the pull of gravity. Noticing your waist area, if anything, any piece of clothing may be tight or restrictive. And your back, see if you'd like to just gently stretch. Perhaps roll the shoulders back a little. And adjust the arms, the hands. so that there's no unnecessary weight. Fingers can be relaxed. Either on your legs, thighs, or maybe in your lap. And 
noticing how your head is positioned on the neck. You might find that you can lift the crown of the head very slightly to the ceiling and this brings a little bit more space. especially in that area between the neck and the skull. <clears throat> Perhaps allowing the shoulders to relax a little bit more. Noticing the brow. See if there's any residual tension or strain in that area. Sometimes we squeeze our brows into a frown. All that can just slowly melt away. The eyes can relax. The jaw can be loose. And you may even wish to bring a slight smile to the lips. There's a gentle welcome into this space. And allowing that smile to spread through your body. As though you were smiling into every cell. And as usual, we're going to do a gentle body sweep to start the meditation. In your own time, at your own speed. Keeping the two aspects of kindfulness in mind. The mindfulness or awareness, which is like the light of the sun, illuminating whatever it contacts, so you can see more deeply into the nature of things. And that moves hand in hand with kindness, which is like the warmth of the sun. Which cares for whatever it comes in contact with. So with this friendly, kindful attitude, I just invite you to gently explore every part of your body from top to toe. Coming more and more deeply into this present moment. into an actual felt experience of now.
staying steady, open and curious to whatever sensations arise. whether physical, bodily sensations, which may be pleasant, unpleasant, or somewhere in between, or emotional experiences, feelings or moods. Allowing them all to just pass through like clouds in the sky. Not trying to control or own, cling on or push away. But just remaining receptive, as though your body and mind were a guest house. And these thoughts, feelings and emotions we're just visitors passing through. Seeming to stay for a while. And then vanishing, passing away. And if you notice you've started to engage with any of these visitors, maybe started to cling to an experience or draw back, move away, just re-establish that sense of open, friendly presence. as though you want to fill up this guest house with a warm atmosphere of non-judgment which allows every visitor to come in understanding that they'll leave of their own accord
None of these experiences belong to you. So there's nothing to control. If you wish to stay with this open awareness to whatever experience arises, whether pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, please do. For those who wish, I'm going to do a little experiment and just sense the whole body with all the sensations that you perceive as slightly unpleasant, 
So being aware of the whole body or as much of the body as you can. Noticing unpleasant sensations. Remembering these are just temporary guests. Noticing if there's any reaction in the mind. Maybe a tendency towards aversion, not wanting. Or whether the mind can just stay present, curious, and receptive to unpleasant experience. giving it as much space as it needs. Now as though taking off one pair of spectacles and putting on another. I'm going to invite you to sense the whole body with any experience or feeling that you consider neither pleasant nor particularly unpleasant, but rather neutral, maybe subtle. hard to discern. Noticing any experience you would regard as neutral in the body and mind. Maybe sensations you haven't noticed before, such as the sensation on the lips, on the cheeks or the palms of the hands. Noticing if there's any tendency to become a little bit dull or disinterested in this rather neutral experience. Or whether you can open up and sense the impermanent nature even in neutral sensations.
And lastly, we're going to put on another pair of spectacles with lenses that notice the pleasant sensations and experiences. Anything you would consider fairly pleasant. anywhere in the body or the mind. It might be a very subtle tingling Perhaps a sense of relaxation, peace. Areas that feel soft or smooth. Whatever you consider pleasant. And notice if there's any tendency to want to hold on, even to own or make this experience last. Instead, stepping back and remembering that these are also guests coming through your guest house. Receiving your warmth and leaving according to their own nature. Staying with this pleasant experience. We're going to end the meditation just by allowing any pleasure, pleasant sensations to radiate outwards with the wish. May all beings be happy. free from craving, aversion, and delusion. May all beings be healthy and safe. May they be free from harm and danger. May all beings live at ease and at peace. May I be well and happy.
free from craving, aversion and delusion. May I be safe and free from danger. May I live at ease and at peace. I ring the bell three times, you might even notice the sensations that arise in your body, in your mind, on hearing the sound of the bell. You can open your eyes on the third ringing if you wish. Meditators like a good stretch. <laughs> it's very nice to see. Please all do have a stretch. I had my eyes closed so I didn't see if there was any nodding meditation going on. <laughs> So, <laughs> the theme of Vedana, as it's called in the Pali language. Um, I've called this uh, this evening the um, wise to the world of feeling. So hopefully it'll help us get a bit more wisdom associated with the feelings that arise in our body and mind. And um, I think this is quite a pertinent topic to me because I started out my practice by making Vedana or what is often translated as sensation or feeling, as the main object of my meditation. And it's a very wonderful object to start with because it gives you that sense of immediacy, you know, coming out of the realm of concepts, thoughts and ideas and straight into a physical felt sense of the world. Um, but feeling and sensation isn't really um, the best translation of Vedana. There are, there are other translations which I think are um, closer to the meaning that the Buddha meant. And one of them is the felt or hedonic tone of experience, which sounds a little bit technical. And I think this idea of a hedonic tone comes from um, psychology. But it's actually the aspect, that aspect or quality of experience, which is pleasant, painful or somewhere in between. And it's the um, conscious experience that can arise at any of the six sense doors. So it's not only related to feelings that arise in the body, although that was the way that I began. It was always translated as sensation and it was very much bodily based. <clears throat> but the Buddha actually says that there are six different kinds of um, feeling that arise dependent on um, the six senses. Yeah, and he talks about how that arises, which I wanted to just read out from um, one of the books. Because it's one thing knowing that Vedana arises and passes, it's another thing understanding how that happens. And we do need that extra element of insight to really start to unravel the process. Yeah, so this is from the, um, what it's called the six sets of six, but don't worry too much about numbers because there's all kinds of different um, like classifications of feeling. One classification is just those three types, pleasure or pleasant, 
painful or unpleasant and somewhere in between so neutral if you want but it's a kind of spectrum yeah sometimes it's not easy to say whether something's particularly pleasant or it's more neutral or sometimes the difference is very subtle between neutral and unpleasant also so don't worry too much about that but it's just to explain that it's the whole sort of spectrum of experience so that's the way to define it in three but you can also define it in six according to the feelings that arise each of the six consciousnesses or the six sense doors and their objects and then you can times that by three if you want and then there's 18 right so it gets kind of technical but um the important thing is is understanding how these arise and so the Buddha says, <clears throat> the six kinds of feelings should be understood. Dependent on the eye and forms. So that's the sense um, organ is the eye and the forms of the sense object. Eye consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is called contact. And with contact as a condition, there is feeling or Vedana, right? So there has to be that contact in order for the feeling to arise. And similarly, he goes to the other um, consciousnesses. So dependent on the ear and sounds, ear consciousness arises. Yeah. So you can only be conscious of something once it comes into contact with the ear. You can only know that there's a sound when that, when that sound touches the eardrum and then ear consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. With contact as a condition, there is feeling. Dependent on the nose and odours, nose consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. With contact as condition, there is feeling. Dependent on the tongue and flavours, tongue consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. And with contact as condition, there is feeling. Dependent on the body and tangibles, which means any sort of um, object that comes in contact with the body, body consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact, and with contact as condition, there is feeling. Dependent on the mind and the mind objects, mind consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact, and with contact as condition, there is feeling. So with reference to this, that it was said that the six classes of feeling should be understood. So this is quite interesting. They also include mind consciousness here. So you see that mind is also a sense um, object in a sense. And um, mind consciousness is a kind of consciousness in and of itself, which also arises and passes away depending on the mind objects that it meets. So we can have mental feeling as well. So that's the world of emotions, of course, right? So I think this is very interesting because straight away it's kind of um, simplifying the realm of experience. You know, usually in life we say, oh, there's this taste and it's delicious or it's fragrant or it's, ooh, it's repulsive or, uh, I don't know, say the smell sense door, there can be a fragrant smell or there can be a really dank and disgusting moldy smell. But here we're coming down to the very fundamentals. It's either pleasant, unpleasant, or somewhere in between. And the beautiful thing is that you can't know that unless you actually experience that in your body and mind at the level of contact, right? And straight away, when I started to receive these teachings, I realized that this gave me a lot of, um, I wouldn't say control, but a sense to start to understand the world in a different way. Because these qualities of pleasure and pain are not in the object themselves they're actually in our experience of that thing so sometimes people say for example oh i love you so much you know i'll always love you but really what you're saying is that you love the way that person makes you feel there are so many pop songs about oh you make me feel like a natural woman or whatever it is you know it's that feeling that we're singing about it's not the person themselves it's the feeling and it's the same way with people that we maybe don't like. Have you ever noticed that, you know, you might meet somebody you don't like and this reaction starts to happen and you don't know where it's coming from? You know, maybe it's because that person reminds you of somebody else or, you know, a memory gets triggered, association there. But if you actually work at the level of feeling in the body, you can notice a sensation arise. 
And what you realize is that you're reacting to that sensation, you're not reacting to that person. And for me, this was really a revelation. And it started to make me realize I wasn't just a victim of whatever happened to me. I had some amount of capacity to be able to influence that and not just be a victim. Yeah. And of course, the outcome of that is that we don't have to try and fix up the world, which is a really good job because that would be very difficult to do. You know, you read the news recently and it's like, first of all, we're sort of speaking against racism and then the people who are against people who are against racism start speaking up. And, you know, we sort of people are destroying statues because they feel that those statues are kind of basically symbols and shrines to racism. And then people are saying, oh, but that's vandalism, that's violence. And so the whole thing becomes this big mess, <laughs> even if people's intentions are quite good in the beginning. You know, it becomes very, very complicated. But if we can get down to that level of experience and just see, is it, what am I actually reacting to here? You know? It may seem like we're reacting to a thought and maybe we are, but even with thinking, this is the beauty of um, working in the body. Even thoughts will have a corresponding sensation in the body. They will flow with a certain feeling. So an angry thought will give rise to kind of tightness maybe in the chest or even a sense of panic or anxiety. Yeah? Sometimes you can see somebody's angry, they get like a hot flush coming up their neck into their face and you know the whole face becomes red and the brow becomes tight. And um, these things really have a physical effect and we can come down to that level in the body and actually experience these things before we move into unwholesome reactions that will basically have an effect on our lives and will set our lives on a particular course, which may or may not be beneficial to ourselves and others. So it's this kind of habitual reaction that is the problem. It's not like in the simile, it's not the guests themselves. Yeah, you can see these experiences of pleasant feeling, unpleasant feeling and, and neutral feeling as guests coming through a house. Yeah, and we're the host. Can we be a receptive and patient host to all these guests equally? Because it's not the guests that are really a problem, it's our reactivity. And the Buddha says, you know, that Vedana, the feeling, is the cause for craving, it's the cause for tanha, which is the root cause for suffering, yeah, in, in dependent origination and also not independent origination, but in the Four Noble Truths. Yeah, tanha is the root cause. For suffering. Independent origination, the first cause is, is um, delusion, which basically means not understanding um, impermanence, thinking that things that are impermanent are actually permanent, yeah? thinking things that are suffering are actually happiness, and, th and taking things that are not self to be a self. That's the definition of delusion. So this is very deep and very deeply ingrained. But we can start to work with the breaking or weakening this cycle of suffering by noticing this link between the Vedana, the experience, the felt sense or effective tone of our experience and that craving that can arise as a result. So, I mean, it's very obvious that when we get pleasant experiences, there's usually an immediate kind of wish to hold on to them, to, you know, not let them go, right? and even to want to make them last for longer. And this is what the Buddha then said is called upadana, which literally means grasping, picking up, holding on. I was thinking about it recently because I actually <laughs> had this crazy idea to give a whole talk about um, one of the old songs that I used to listen to by NXS. <laughs> but I feel like I should at least bring it into the talk today because it's called New Sensation. <laughs> and I used to love that song when I was a teenager and I was just getting kind of, excited about you know rebelling and seeing the world and taking a different course in life than my parents had taken so this was kind of really cool yeah new sensation and the words go something like um a new sensation got a hold on me um it's gonna take you over right and what else is it um yeah so impossible to refuse a new sensation Perfect moments, so impossible to refuse. 
And this is how we celebrate sensations, isn't it? I mean, this is how we're culturally conditioned to respond to pleasure. It's like we write songs about it. We get really poetic about it. And it's supposed to be a wonderful thing when this sensation has a hold on you. <laughs> but of course, from a Buddhist perspective, it's really not pleasant to be in the clutches of craving, right? We don't only become addicted to the objects of craving, such as chocolate or maybe sex or um, power, right? Power is a big one, isn't it? You can see that the world over. We actually become addicted to the craving itself. We become addicted to wanting, addicted to desire, because it gives us this sense that there's something somewhere better than what we have now. Yeah? We become addicts to craving and this makes everything much more difficult. Because without that craving, we actually don't know who we are. It's like, why are we here if not to want? Why are we here if not to crave? So that gives you the, you know, obviously the converse um, insight that the way out of being and, and suffering is to stop this wanting, to just learn to be content with where we are and we start moving in a different direction. And then of course, there's the unpleasant sensation. So the Buddha says, yeah, that the pleasant sensations have this underlying tendency to lust, to desire. So it's not our fault as such, it's actually natural that they would lead towards that. That's the underlying tendency. But then the unpleasant sensations have the underlying tendency, of course, to aversion and to not wanting, to pushing away. Yeah. And this is also a kind of craving. It's a craving to get rid of, a craving to, you know, remove ourselves from the situation or separate from a particular person who upsets us or even from watching the news or even sometimes from wanting to do the right thing because it doesn't feel good for us right and when we can have a little bit of equanimity with that we can actually learn to tolerate a little bit of that unpleasantness from time to time as long as it's not harmful i've noticed for myself i'm able to move into situations and act more on a value aligned basis that makes sense like i'm actually able to align my actions more with my values than with my feelings right so i don't choose something just because it feels good i do it because it's right you know even giving a dhamma talk i mean okay i've been doing it a few years now but there's always a little bit of oh you know this isn't really the way i want to spend the day thinking about vedana and will the words come out and you know ooh, there's all those people waiting you can start to do this you know or you can say okay so this is the feeling this is the sensation that's conditioned by my upbringing or you know it's just thoughts that i don't have to buy into and i can connect to what's underneath that which is a real genuine wish to share the dhamma and to be of service and also to learn you know i love actually sort of thinking around these subjects because it gives me chance to um really look into my experience and find what's helped me what's worked for me or what hasn't and get some input back as well and um yeah always connecting it too with things that happen in the world you know i read something today about um very sad story about um an indian film star only 34 and he committed suicide he had apparently everything going for him you know a girlfriend a good family and he'd made it you know at a young age into the bollywood film industry and who knows why? I mean, everyone says, of course, look at him, he's got this big smile. But you just don't know how a person feels inside. And the thing there is that a person's feeling bad, right? It's these feelings that hook us and that make us deluded into thinking they're going to last. And of course, with something like a chronic depression, it really can feel that they're going to last. And we really do need to get psychological support in those situations. I wouldn't say just observe the feeling and just stay with it, you know, if you find it's building and getting worse. But still, this insight into the impermanent nature of experience, including the happiness and the pain, is so helpful to just unhook us from that story and to be able to um, stand back and have the stability and spaciousness of mind to allow these feelings to just play out and to subside. Yeah. And I think for me in my practice, this was the first step, you know, becoming aware of these feelings, noticing how they're arising and that they're impermanent. 
But later on in my practice, I also realized there was something slightly missing because it's not just understanding the arising and passing, it's also seeing how we are fueling the arising and passing. Yeah. For example, I mean, my best examples around this really are the difference when your mind is in a state of loving kindness compared to a state of maybe just bare awareness. You will notice in that state, if your mind is kind of suffused with like goodwill and loving kindness, it's a wholesome state of mind. The experience that arises is actually different. Yeah. Even if pleasant experience, unpleasant experience arises, it meets this mind of loving kindness. And it's as though it's diluted. It's as though it just, it can be held in a much bigger container. And there is a simile in the suttas called the simile of the salt that explains this very nicely. It says that um, if you have a lump of salt and the Buddha says, what happens if you put it in a glass of water? You know, a big, nice, solid pink Himalayan lump. Can you drink that water? And of course, the monks and nuns say, no, 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 this water's terrible, it's really salty. And he said, but what if you put that same chunk of salt in a big lake? Can you drink the water? And they say, well, you wouldn't even notice the salt in a big lake like that. And that is a little bit about how the results of past karma, the, the experiences we're having now, um, change depending on the mind that they meet in the present. So if something very painful comes up when you're tired or already a little bit down or you've just had a difficult phone call with a friend and then somebody else says something that really gets to you, this is really difficult because it's meeting this small mind, a prickle and contracted mind. There's no place for that salt. It's already salty and you're adding salt. But if you know, you've got a mind of loving kindness and you're focusing a lot on gratitude, on contentment and bringing up the goodness of your life, yeah? or you've just had, I don't know, a lovely walk with a friend and you're feeling refreshed and somebody says something unpleasant to you or even, I don't know, you get a bad stomach ache, it doesn't bother you too much, right? Because your mind is wide and spacious. And in loving kindness, it's really incredible that Sometimes you can think about a difficult person and they just, even the concept or the perception of them being difficult disappears because they meet this flow of loving kindness and there isn't the same impact on the mind. So this is very, very interesting because we're starting to see how these different experiences arise and how by the way we relate to them in the present, we can actually influence them and lead them towards um, softening, calming, and eventually ceasing altogether. Yeah. So for years in Burma, I was practicing with arising and passing away, and I was seeing, you know, this body and mind like just like sandbanks, kind of falling down, falling down. You know, the Buddha also talks about winds in the sky or clouds in the sky, and that the Vedana kind of floats through like clouds. But for me, it was even more subtle. It was like you couldn't really hold on to anything. It was literally like sand falling through the fingers. I could just feel the sensation. The moment they arise, they were gone. And the emphasis was very much on ceasing, ceasing, ceasing. Everything was just flowing through. So I thought that I was practicing, you know, fairly well and that I had a lot of equanimity and it gave me a real sense of... Um, resilience I guess towards whatever I would meet and um, a lot of peace and contentment there but then you know after a few years I was reading the Satipatthana Sutta as many of us do and it talks about the Buddha says in there like if you practice properly you can be enlightened in seven years now by now I'd already been practicing more than seven years about 13 years yeah, because I started in 96. So around 2009, I was in Burma, my third year of monastic life. And, um, you know, practicing really intensively. We basically could sit for 16 hours a day. There was nothing more to do than to practice. It was really fantastic condition. Um, but it's like, hmm, seven years. Okay, well, I guess I haven't been fully mindful for seven years. But then the Buddha says, what about seven years? Even five years? Even four? Three, two, one? And he gets down and down and down until he says, if you're practicing properly, you will be fully enlightened or almost fully enlightened, the third stage, in seven days. So I start to think, oh, something's missing from my practice. 
right? And one thing I could see was that there was a very clear sense that sensations and emotions were rising and passing, like as quick as mustard seeds. I think there's something in the Abhidhamma about mustard seeds in the pan. <laughs> um, but there was still this sense in the background that there was this thing watching, yeah, which was quite stable, almost permanent. There's this subtle sense of self. And this is the problem. And then it was amazing because I read the Satipatthana Sutta properly in the Pali and the, the little um, phrase, Vinaya loke abhijja dhamanasa came up. And this literally means that one should practice the Satipatthana having restrained the five hindrances. Vinaya is like Vinaya, but this means having restrained. And abhijja dhamanasa basically is a, a um, shorthand for what we call the five hindrances. And these five hindrances were not very obvious in my mind. I, like I say, I was very even, very balanced and content. But still, when you look at the dependent origination and it, you realize that it starts with delusion, these five hindrances are the thing that nourish delusion. So as long as they're operating, delusion is still present in the way we're aware. So then I realized it wasn't enough just to work at the level of Vedana and to try to stop the Vedana going into craving, you know, to break the link between Vedana and Tanha. Because the whole cycle starts with delusion and delusion is nourished by the five hindrances. And this is one of the reasons that the Satipatthana Sutta doesn't work in the way it should without the deep meditation. Because it's only in the deep states of Samadhi that those five hindrances are really abandoned for longer periods of time. So I definitely experienced the point where the hindrances were very weak, but not fully abandoned. And I'm still not sure I can say they're fully abandoned. Like, I mean, there may be some periods when it's felt like it's fully abandoned, but you can't really be sure unless you get a lot of very, very deep meditation for long periods of time. And so this really changed my attitude to the practice. And, in, and shortly after that, it was when I met Ajahn Brown's teachings and he focused on that exact same passage in the Satipatthana Sutta and said that this is why you need to practice the jhanas. So it was so serendipitous for me and I realized that this was missing. So we can work at the level of sensation and I would really encourage that. You know, we can open up to it. We can start to see our habit patterns and the way that we react, yeah, the way that we cling, the way we hold on. And also with the neutral sensations, there's an underlying tendency to just dull out, not to notice them, right? To become kind of lethargic and bored. So we have to become aware of these sensations. And hopefully you had a little introduction to that if you've not already been practicing that way in the meditation where you can actually sense the different sensations and maybe which direction your mind wants to go in. And also by understanding that these sensations are impermanent really helps us not to react. Because what's the point reacting when something is anyway arising pass and passing away? It starts to make no sense anymore to make a big deal out of it or even to start owning these things, right? How can we own things that are just coming and going? according to conditions of their own accord. So these are all really, really interesting investigations to do. But I think the reason that the Buddha taught the Satipatthana was also to uncover the delusion of a self. Yeah? So he wanted us to look in these four different areas where we tend to assume a sense of self. And those four areas are the body, the Vedana, feeling again, the mind and the mental um, contents, you could say, the objects of the mind, yeah? And the reason he wanted us to do this was to see that none of these belong to us, none of these are me, mine, or a self. There's another beautiful sutta called the Anatalakana Sutta, which many of you might know, it's called the Discourse on Non-Self. And the Buddha says, for every one of these um, components of existence, the Buddha says that they are, he asks the monks who are listening to the discourse, he says, is feeling, is Vedana, is it permanent or impermanent? So of course they all say, it's impermanent, venerable sir. And then he says, is what's impermanent suffering or happiness? 
So what's the answer? <laughs> suffering, venerable sir, because it has to go, right? No matter how happy it is, it has to be suffering because you're gonna lose it. The happiest experience in the world doesn't last. Even the deep jhanas don't last, right? We can accept Nibbana there because that lasts. <laughs> but everything else it doesn't last, right? And even Nibbana is not a self. I mean, don't get that wrong either. That's also not a self. Um, and so then he says, okay, so if these things, if something is impermanent and it's suffering, is it fit to be called a self? You know, and Ajahn Brahm always makes this a little bit more clear. Instead of saying a self, he says a permanent essence. Because basically that's what a self has to be. What's the point calling something that's impermanent and full of suffering a self? I mean, you don't want to keep a self if it's full of suffering and impermanence, right? You don't want like a permanently suffering self. So he calls it a permanent essence. So what is the, how can there be a permanent essence which is suffering and, and impermanent? <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. And the whole point of seeing that something is not self, not me, not mine, not self, is to realize that we can't control these things, right? We can't actually control them. Unpleasant experiences arise due to conditions. Pleasant experiences arise due to conditions. When those conditions cease, those experiences cease. So all we need to do is learn to understand the causes for those arising, those conditions arising, and remove the causes and the problem is solved. The whole of dependent origination starts to unravel once you see through delusion, yeah? Because you see there's nothing in there, there's no one there to own anything. So it's not that an enlightened person never has any unpleasant sensations or Vedana, either mental or emotional, I'm, uh, sorry, physical. They may still get tired. They probably won't have like, emotions based on defilements, but they'll still have the natural kind of moods of life, right? There'll be times when they're clearer, times when they're wearier, there'll be pain in the body. But at that point, it really doesn't matter because there's not this, it doesn't lead into the craving to get rid of or to, to hold on to anything in the world. And I think, you know, from my teacher, what I understand is that when you pass through the deeper and deeper jhanas, you start to realize that even these most exalted states of mind are impermanent and therefore are not the final goal. Even those states are a kind of suffering. Yeah? And there was an enlightened bhikkhuni in the Buddha's day called Vajira, and she actually said that in a nutshell, she said, I think it was Mara who asked her, what is this existence or who are you? And she said, it's just suffering arising and suffering passing away. That's all it is, just suffering arising and suffering passing away. And I don't know about you hearing this, but I find that so exhilarating just to imagine that that insight is possible, you know, just to get a sense that that is really all it is. It's such a relief. It's such a relief. There's not a problem here, yeah? Pleasant, unpleasant, anything in between, it's okay. It's just arising, it's passing away, and it's not who you are. It's not happiness. You know, some people may seem to have it better than you. They're still suffering, you know? There's nothing really to be so envious of. The most important thing is not how we feel in our lives. It's not whether the effective tone of our experience is pleasure or pain. The most important thing is the value, the ethics, the virtue that we live with the value and meaning of our life, right? So when we can make this the focus, instead we start to move towards a different kind of happiness. And the Buddha then says that there are three other kinds of feeling which are the same, pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral, but these are now the spiritual ones. They're not the worldly ones associated with the senses. They're the feelings associated with deep spirituality, yeah? And this is a different kind of happiness which is much more reliable and eventually culminates in the end of perception and feeling completely. So this is very interesting because even in the Buddha's day when he taught this, um, some people said, well, how can you say that when there's an end of feeling, that's pleasant? Because if there's no feeling, how can there be anything pleasant? And the Buddha actually um, says, well, I just say that it's pleasant wherever you find happiness. It doesn't have to depend on feeling. And even better than that is where 
his chief disciple Sariputta says that it's precisely because there's no feeling and no perception that Nibbana is the highest happiness. <laughs> so that's kind of deep. And unless we've experienced Nibbana, we can't really understand that. But I think one of the beautiful things about this path is that we're moving gradually towards, um, first of all, working with those sensations or feelings, which may be pleasant, unpleasant and neutral, and just gaining, not changing them, but just gaining the equanimity, the stability, the peace of mind to remain um, even among all those sensations, to remain content with this changing nature of life. And then later, as that starts to subside and we start to overcome the hindrances and uncover, uproot this delusion, we start to move away from those kind of experiences into the spiritual um, experiences of jhanas and deep, blissful states of mind. So we kind of gradually wean ourselves off the lesser happinesses and move towards the more exalted, lasting and beautiful, deeply enriching happinesses until eventually the mind is so peaceful and calm that everything ceases and we can experience complete peace. So I can't claim to have experienced that, but I do have enough con confidence in at least two or three of my teachers who I've spoken to at length about these things and I think it's, I have the faith that it's real, that it's possible and that we can make a good start and, you know, we can make that start right here, right now with whatever's arising and just notice the way we relate to whatever comes into our mind. Mm -hmm. Learn to look at it through the lens of impermanence and through the lens of non-self, reflecting whatever arises is not me, not mine, not a self. And I'm going to quote what Karen's written in here. Thank you, Karen, because this is one of my favorite quotes and it ends the talk so perfectly. The Buddha basically says is that nothing whatsoever is worth clinging to. It's slightly different from the way you've translated it here, but it's basically the same. Nothing is me, mine or a self, but he also says, therefore, nothing is worth clinging to. Nothing is worth holding on to. Yeah. So it's all about letting go. So that is enough for me, quite deep. Maybe useful, maybe not very useful, maybe conceptual, maybe practical, I don't know. <laughs> but hopefully there was something there that um, was helpful. So.